Well, tonight we're going to be continuing our look at what Scripture says about God, specifically the existence of God. Well, tonight we're going to be looking at the top, a topic related to apologetics. What an apologetics has nothing to do, if you've never heard the term before, has nothing to do with apologizing. You are not saying, I'm sorry for believing in Jesus and God, I'm sorry. No, and we're not doing that. It comes from the Greek apologia, or to make a defense of. In other words, apologetics is defending the faith. It's arguing that what we believe is true, and here's reasons why it is true. Now, apologetics really comes down to, it's really a a, a subset, a subcategory of a topic that I love, a topic that many despise, and if you've ever gone to college and had to take a class on this, you probably hated the class, unless you're a weirdo like me. Philosophy. Well, apologetics is a subset, a subcategory of philosophy. So I'm going to be introducing some philosophical ideas that are very complex, but I'm going to very much simplify them. And I'll be pointing you to some other resources if you want to learn more about it. But I'm going to be taking a very... Imagine if you've seen like the 1,000, 1,500, 3,000-piece puzzles. Imagine if you had a 50 bazillion piece puzzle, I'm going to try to condense that down into like, you know, the the child's 10 piece puzzle. (laughs) That's tough. Well, I'm going to attempt it, and I hope I can do it justice. I may or may not, but I'm going to do my best. What is the value of apologetics? Well, first I need to mention mention some statistics that have been coming out in the last five, 10 years. There have been some trends in America, actually, and actually the world. They are actually not good. Overall, the number of people who are saying, yes, I affiliate or associate myself with a religious belief, it doesn't matter which one, is on a rapid decline. The number of people who say, I affiliate or, con- or consider myself a Christian, is on the decline. The number of people who say that they are, now there's a difference here between non-affiliated and non-religious. There are many people who say, I affiliate with no particular religion, but I myself am religious. But those who say, I affiliate with no particular religion is on a rapid incline, rapid increase. And the number of people who are actually saying, who I, am, I affiliate with a specific religion, is on the decline, make matters worse. The number of people who say, I am atheist or agnostic, is on an extremely rapid increase. It used to be that when we evangelized, we would be dealing with someone who had a somewhat similar worldview, a worldview of God exists. That does not exist today. We cannot assume the person we're talking to believes that there is a God. Odds are, they may reject the idea that God even exists. Their worldview is completely different, which makes evangelism tough which is where apologetics comes into play. Now, I put out a video a while back on how to evangelize an atheist or anybody else for that matter. It was one of my more popular videos among atheists. Why? Because well, I, I use the keyword atheist and played the system. Um, <laughs> but there were some people who critiqued it, and they failed to consider... You know, remember, I talk about context a lot. Well, the context of this video was the audience for the video were Christians. And the problem I saw in Christian media, problem I saw in Christians on, well, don't, don't get me started on Christians online. You want to see where Christians really are not Christians? Go online. Uh, <laughs> oh, they're awful, honestly. We are awful as Christians online. We really need to do better. The problem I saw was a stereotyping of people who weren't Christians. Whatever you think of the movie or the series, I should say, one of the more recent culprits of this is the God's Not Dead series. What they said is this, or at least here's the the caricature of an atheist. Atheists are atheists simply because they're mad at God. No. There are many atheists who will actually admit, because this is one of the arguments against the atheist professor, how can you be mad at a God that you don't believe exists? Many atheists will will say, no, I'm not mad at God. I can't be. He doesn't exist. How can I be mad at something that doesn't exist? Well, it's a stereotype that we have. We're in, and what I saw is a lot of Christians, what they would say is, atheists believe and then impose those beliefs on atheists and argue against those beliefs. And the atheist goes, I don't believe any of that. 
sorry, that's not my view. It makes it difficult to evangelize when we're telling them what they believe. And the video was really, really more of a, of a case of, hey, Christians, show them the love that you want showed to you, the, show, the love that Jesus showed to you, show them that love. And it's really about how to interact with people who have different beliefs. And when you evangelize them, how do you approach it? And it wasn't a, a video of, here's the steps that you need to give to convince them. And a lot of atheists said, well, he didn't say what you need to do to convince us. Well, that wasn't the point of the video, really. In the video, I think one of the things I mentioned is this. There are many Christians who believe in a flat earth, that NASA is of the devil, that space is a myth, we never went to the moon, and we live under a, what is it, glass or water, or it depends on which Christian you ask, but it's, 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 it's this dome that we live under, and the, and the sun is a little smaller than earth, and road, it's, no. But imagine... Imagine someone coming to you as a Christian and saying, oh, you're a Christian? Well, that means you believe in a flat earth. You, are, you believe this and that and this other thing. And you sit there and go, I don't believe any of that. Why are you saying I believe that stuff? That's not me. Why are you saying I'm... Because every Christian I hear online says those things. Well, that's what we do to non-Christians. We should not do that. My answer is, ask them their opinions. Ask them their thoughts. You don't have to agree with them. See where they're at and approach them where they're at. But this is where apologetics comes into play. Now, in dealing with apologetics, there are generally four common approaches to doing apologetics. And I have those four outlined here. Now, none of these is a foolproof guaranteed to convince anybody that what we say is true. We can use the best arguments ever conceived. And I will stand by this. God himself could show up in front of their face and they may not be convinced. My proof for that, God did show up in front of people's faces and they still rejected him. So none of these approaches is guaranteed to convince anybody. None of these approaches are really absolutely certain. They all have weaknesses and they all have strengths. But we're going to go over them. Now, these are four approaches that deal with philosophy. But I'm going to simplify them. The first, first approach to doing apologetics or arguing for the existence of God is to have a cosmological argument. What is the cosmological argument? Well, a cosmological argument looks at the, the nature of the cosmos itself. You could summarize it this way. The universe exists. Now, this is a very simplistic summary. Then the universe exists. If the universe exists, the source of that universe must exist. Ergo, God exists. That's a very simplified approach to cosmology. And I've written down here, looks at the nature of the cosmos. Everything in the universe has a cause. Creation, I have around creation. Oh, by the way, Non-believers don't like the word creation, so I'm content to say universe. Okay, you don't, like, you don't want to call it creation? Fine, we'll call it universe. Universe exists, creation exists, so it has a cause. God's that cause. Now, there are some people that actually do use this approach to proving God's existence. And one of them is something you've, you've read before a few times, I'm sure, called Scripture. David used this approach. When you talked about nature itself, creation itself reveals God. That's a cosmological argument. Paul uses it when he says that, that no one has any excuse because God has revealed himself in his creation. A cosmological argument. Some other people that you may have never heard of, but these are individuals you can check out who do use the cosmological argument. One of them is Norman Geisler. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, but he was a Christian theologian and apologist. And he often used the cosmological argumentation. Another one, a guy that's out there now doing a lot of work, is J. Warner Wallace. He is a former atheist turned Christian, now Christian apologist. And he does a whole lot of defense 
of the existence of God, the, the nature of Christ, and salvation. In fact, uh, if you ever heard the, the title, uh, Cold Case Christianity, that's J. Warner Wallace. Check him out. He's really, really good. Another guy who's a little bit more classical, and I say classical by how we often define classical, meaning like in the 70s. Uh, I know, I just said that's old. Um, William Lane Craig. Now, William Lane Craig has come under some criticism because he has opened the door to things such as the creation story being a bit mythological. Whether people think that's what he's saying or not, I haven't looked into it in depth, but he has received some criticism. However, he is a, an established Christian apologist who does make a lot of good arguments for the existence of God, and he often uses the cosmological approach. Now, the people I'm going to mention don't necessarily use only one of these methods. They may use two, three, four, or something. But uh, those who have used and or do use the cosmological include, like I said, Scripture, Geisler, Wallace, and Craig, and there's others. Now, the third one is teleological. Teleological looks at the structure of the cosmos. What do you mean second one? I said third. I meant second one. The second one, teleological, it looks like the looks at the the order, the structure of the universe. Basically, the argument goes like this. The universe, or aspects of nature, has an order. If there is an order that is understandable, that means someone or something had to establish that order. That someone or something is God. The intelligent design uh, movement falls under the teleological approach. One of the big proponents of that is Stephen C. Meyer. Uh, he is a scientist who does a whole lot of looking at biology and saying, what does biology tell us? And he argues that, that in one of his books, Signature in the Cell, he even argues that the cell itself is so well designed, it must have a designer. You may have heard Ray Comfort. You may have heard him uh, say something like this. If you see a painting, you know there's a painter. If you see creation, you know there's, there's a creator. It's a form of a teleological argument, mixing in with a little bit of cosmology. But it is a teleological, looking at the structure of the cosmos. The third one, the actual third one, ontological. Now, this one's a fun one. Why do I say that? Because this is the one that, is, that was a favorite among many Christian apologists. And it is also one of the most difficult to figure out. Here's why. It deals with the nature of being or existence. And there are subgroups of the ontological argument. But the ontological argument, put into a very simple nutshell, I have it this way. The idea exists, thus the thing must also exist. Or as they had um, the character Dr. Gregory House once say in an episode, the word exists, the thing the word references is, exists. There's some issues with that argument used today, and I'll get to that in a minute. Oh, I forgot to cover some others. The teleological, some proponents besides Meyer, J. Warner Wallace does also use the teleological, but also a gentleman named William Dembski. Um, he actually taught at Southwestern Seminary for a few years, and he was, a, he was very popular. He taught apologetics, he taught philosophy, he taught religion. And this guy, at the time, had two PhDs. He had a, a religious, I think, it was in, I think it was in theology, and he had a PhD, I think, in some degree of physics. And he was working on a third. The guy's smart. But I, he had a view, he viewed creation as an old earth, millions of years old idea. I disagree with him on that one. But he was a, a Christian apologist, actually was, is a Christian apologist. He often uses the teleological argument. The ontological, some people who have used the ontological include people like Paul. An example of Paul using the ontological or the looking at, this, at the nature of, of existence. You remember when Paul said, Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, that means people do not. Actually, actually let me rethink it. 
He said, Jesus rose from the dead. However, if people do not rise from the dead, that means Jesus himself did not rise from the dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, what we believe is false, and therefore we're the most pitied. It was a ontological argument, arguing from the existence of Jesus as a resurrected being. And, well, Paul's right in that. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then nothing else matters. We often point to the cross. Paul said, look at the resurrection. Well, anyway, that doesn't mean the cross isn't important. It's just saying, don't forget that part too. It doesn't stop at Calvary. It goes all the way to the tomb and goes beyond that. But some others who have used the ontological, a classical one that is still referenced today in philosophy classes is a guy named Anselm. And many people have taken Anselm's argument, which I, I read it the other day three times, it's tough. It's a tough read. I was reading it from a source that few people probably nowadays will go to as far as if they're just looking up things online. Stanford University. Yeah, who in here looks up Stanford University stuff? I'm a weirdo. <laughs> I actually had someone give me a book on philosophy because I like philosophy. And it's like, eh, okay. But it was a tough read. I had to read it three times, and I'm sitting there going, I got a PhD, and I'm still struggling with this. Anselm's argument was tough, not because it was difficult to understand, but because the language was weird. It wasn't normal speak as we would say it in the 21st century today. But another one is B.B. Warfield. You may have heard of him before. B.B. Warfield used the ontological arguments. Also, Alvin Plantinga. Alvin Plantinga really did not develop a new argument. He took Anselm's argument revised it, tweaked it, improved it, and I found this interesting. There weren't a lot of people critiquing Plantinga, but they sure went after Anselm and others, including Warfield, but Plantinga is all... I don't know if it was because they dismissed him and said, the guy is just flat out wrong, so we don't even have to acknowledge him, or if it was, guy's got a good argument. I don't know. I can't read into what the intent was, but Plantinga uses the ontological argument. The fourth one is the moral argument. The moral argument is based on the idea that there are morals, and it goes like this. Morals exist. Morals have to come from somewhere. Ergo, there's a God because that's where we get the morals from. Now, that's a very simplistic summary. There's some problems with that argument as well. As far as using these in everyday conversations, that's really where the rubber hits the road. We have the cosmological, we have the teleological, we have the ontological, and we have the moral. Most arguments you will hear, or most people you will hear defending the faith, their arguments can be in one of those four categories. Again, this is a summary. What they deal with, the nature of the cosmos or universe, especially the fact that it has a cause. It's a, it's a causal argument. Basically, it exists, therefore it had to start somewhere. Teleological deals with the nature of order or structure in nature. Well, the ontological existence. Yes, use an argument based upon existence to prove the existence of God. The moral, well, it's morals. Here's where the rubber hits the road. I believe, and this is purely my opinion, when it comes to normal conversations, the ontological, although it was a favorite among many for many years, in fact, it is still used today, and the moral are the two weakest. I would not recommend them when arguing or talking to an atheist or agnostic. These are not good approaches. Here's why. The ontological argument from a philosophical standpoint, in order for, the, for an ontological argument to make sense, both parties have to have certain shared, accepted viewpoints. An atheist will often say, I don't agree with anything you said. No common ground, it's hard, hard to build an argument, and they will reject you from the beginning. But also, the ontological says this. This is a little bit more detailed than the idea exists, so the thing exists. It goes in, to this idea. If you can imagine something, the only way that you can imagine something 
is if in some possible world that thing existed. If that thing could never exist, there's no way for you to actually ever imagine that thing. Okay, in what world do unicorns exist? Anybody ever seen Lord of the Rings or Star Wars? Lightsabers cannot exist. I'm sorry. No laws of physics allow the lightsaber as portrayed in Star Wars to exist. It can't happen. Yet people imagine those things. But they're not real at all. An atheist would say, oh, I can imagine all kinds of things that are not real. So saying that if I can imagine it, it must be real somewhere is false. They will immediately reject the ontological argument. Now, moral argument. Morals exist. We have to get morals from somewhere. What's the source? We believe the source is God. Here's the argument from an atheist or agnostic. Morals can exist without any kind of a deity. Morals are merely, and you'll probably hear this term on on media or social media, that morals are a social construct. They are developed by cultures, and they are accepted cultural norms that everybody lives by. And those norms can vary. An example, there are certain words that in America are considered foul language. We don't say them. But some of those words, if you go to England, are as common and accepted as the word dog or a cat. There's no vulgarity. Who's right? Is their moral of those words being okay, right? Or is ours that says those words are wrong? Who who decides that? Well, society does that. This is the argument against the moral argument that God exists. Society decides what is right and wrong. And so you can have different morals in different cultures. We call this moral relativism. However, as Christians, we reject moral relativism because of what moral relativism, if you take it to its utmost extreme, which is usually where you can find the fallacy or the problem with it, I actually proposed this in a missions class at seminary. Dr. Idol was talking about moral relativism, and he had an example that was a bit intense, a student raised a more intense, more extreme example. And I'm going to use that example here. If this offends anybody, it's not my intent. You have someone coming from another country. doesn't matter what country it is. They come here. They go find themselves a 12-year-old little girl and rape her. And they say, in my culture, this is acceptable. Moral relativism says you cannot hold them guilty, because in their culture, it's acceptable. The only way to hold them accountable is, well, in this culture, it's not. However, we believe as Christians, there is no moral relativity. There is moral absolute. It is wrong to rape that girl here or in any other culture. And so therefore, we hold that person guilty. But moral relativism says, you can have two things that You're wrong in one place and right in another. And who's right, who's wrong? It depends on the culture. So the moral argument, to get back to this, I believe the moral argument is a weak one because non-Christians, atheists, and agnostics will reject any moral argument and say morals are based on culture, not upon God. And you're going to get nowhere. These two, I believe, are the two strongest arguments. And by the way, these are the two that are most often used in Scripture, by the way. (laughs) Coincidence? I think not. But I believe these are the two strongest. Why? Because let's take the teleological that says there is an order, a design as we might call it, but there is an understandable, explainable, discoverable structure to nature. Non-Christians and Christians will agree with that. The question that where they disagree is, How did that order come about? Christians say it was created by a designer, and we identify the designer as who he is, God. An atheist would say, there is no designer. It happened through millennia as things adapted to their situations. It resulted in order, which Christians say, that's called randomness and chance, which to a point it is. But they, they have an agreement that there is an order and structure. It makes it 
easier to actually make an argument this way because you're not beginning from a, from a place here where they say, I, I totally reject all premises. Or here, sorry, morals are relative. So these can be used, but I do not believe in a modern-day normal conversation these are going to be effective, these will be more effective. Now, if you are able to use these two, great, use them. But again, none of these approaches are guaranteed to convince a single person. Not a one. Why? Because something that not every Christian wants to admit, arguments don't convince anybody about God. Now, how do we know that? Well, we turn to first looking at worldviews. There, there are two worldviews that, we, that we're dealing with. One, I've written down, is a theistic worldview. Those who hold a theistic worldview believe that there is a supreme being. As Christians, we know he's Yahweh. Muslims falsely believe it's Allah. Uh, Hindus believe it's whatever they believe. And, you know, but they all have their own false gods. We have the one true God. How do we know that? The Bible says so. And the Bible is God's word. But a theistic worldview says there is a higher being out there, and everything that they see and whatever evidence is presented to them, they're going to see through the lens of their, of their theistic worldview. A non-theistic or atheistic worldview says there is no higher being, and so when evidence is presented to them, they're going to see all that evidence through the lens of their non-theistic or atheistic worldview and it's going to define how they interpret that evidence. So, the argument itself will convince nobody. Now, in today's culture, in a postmodern world, they would say, you can have two truths that are contradictory, and they can both be right. Wrong. Two contradictory truths cannot coexist. Therefore, God cannot both not exist and exist. It can't happen. So only one view is correct, theistic or atheistic. It's theistic. That's the only right view. But no argument is going to convince them. Does someone want to turn to Psalm 10, verses 3 and 4? Psalm 10, verses 3 and 4. In his arrogance, he declares there is no God. Atheists today will say, I don't believe in God because I haven't seen evidence for God's existence. And my answer is wrong. You have been presented evidence. You reject the evidence because in your arrogance, you're going to declare there is no God. Why? Because this begins, the wicked boasts of the desires of himself, his soul. I want what I want. That's called human nature. Apart from Christ, that's all of us. Well, Psalm 14.1 and Psalm 53.1 say except for one little phrase, they're identical. 14.1 says this, The fool in his heart says, or the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. By the way, that was quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 3. 53.1 says it this way, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There's your variation on wording, but it's pretty much the same thing. There is none who does good. And we, I didn't quote Romans 3 here because most of us know Romans 3. There is none who does good, none seek after God, and so forth. So, so far the people who are apart from Christ are not seeking God. They're not looking for him. They don't want to believe in him. They refuse to believe in him, so they reject him. And that pretty much says, that's pretty much what Paul says in Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God, is, I'm sorry, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, by who, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. No argument will ever convince anybody. Why? Because apart from God himself acting, they will reject the evidence presented. So when an atheist says, I have never seen evidence for God, no, you have. You've rejected the evidence because it doesn't fit your worldview. Now, that does not mean don't share the evidence. We should. We should. Because here's how it works. God convinces them. God 
changes their hearts. God works in them and shows them the truth. It's the Holy Spirit who does that, and the Holy Spirit works through the sharing of the truth. When we share the gospel, it is the Holy Spirit that convicts them of their sin. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts them that that, that God is real. It is the Holy Spirit that does the work to make them see the evidence for what it is. We will never convince them. We just tell them the truth and that God convinced them. Well, that should be a bit of a relief that we don't have to save anybody because we can't. So if someone doesn't accept Jesus Christ, we should not be, I failed, I didn't do it right. No. Instead, we should go, I shared the truth. I'm going to continue to pray for them that maybe the next person they talk to who shares the truth with them, God will open their eyes. Or maybe that God has already opened their eyes, but they're struggling and they're resisting. And maybe the next person when they're talking to will be the one that leads them to Christ. So when it comes to apologetics, we must defend the faith. We must present the evidence. And like I said, I believe saying, look, there's a universe that had to come from somewhere. Now we can debate the origins of the universe, and we do debate that. There are Christians who adopted Big Bang and Christianize it. I'd, I've heard good arguments for that. I've heard arguments against the Big Bang. I've heard good, good, good arguments that way. I don't know. I know God made it. I heard one theologian say one time, it was in seminary, he explained the Big Bang this way, based on his interpretation of Genesis 1. He argued, based upon the Hebrew, that cre- all, everything that was created was created like that in Genesis 1.1. Everything else based upon the Hebrew word was taking that which was created and forming it. The problem with his argument is it opened up the door to evolution. But it was formed. And he said the Big Bang was, Big Bang was Genesis 1-1. And I went, God still made it. I don't know how. He's God. I'll leave that up to him. You know, saying, look, there, there is a universe that, that we live in, obviously. Where did it come from? How did it get here? And we can explain that everything has a cause outside of itself. And that trail goes all the way back. And this is why why I personally like the cosmological argument. Cosmological argument, let's say this is time. This is the moment when time was formed. Before that, there was no time. Well, in time, everything, everything has a cause, that is, came from somewhere. Something caused every, something else to happen. Nothing exists without, it cause, without something causing it to exist. That includes the universe. So, you know, these things are all caused by something else, and we can say, you know, arrows, and it's always, you know, causation, 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 so forth. But then we get to here. By the way, in the cosmological argument, there is always, always something that does not have a cause. It is considered the the primary or ultimate, or various terms, ultimate cause. It itself does not have a beginning. It does not have a cause. It just always was. And scientists right now are trying to discover that. You've probably heard of the the Higgs bottom or Higgs bottom, whatever, Higgs, whatever. Um, What they call the God particle. They believe that that is the ultimate cause, and it has no origin. It just always was. So the question in the cosmological argument it really is this. What's the ultimate cause? That ultimate cause has no origin. It just always was. So we can look at Scripture. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word. God has no cause. He is the ultimate cause. He created it all. The cosmological argument, people always get wrapped up in what caused this, what caused that, what's the ultimate cause, where did it come from originally? It's God. That's why I like the cosmological argument. And by the way, like I said, Scripture uses this argument throughout it. The teleological reason that I like that is very simple. You all see me do these kind of things before. Let's see. We're going to make a stick man who's going to be happy. We're going to make a stick child. He's going to be sad. He didn't get his cookies. He wanted cookies before supper. And mommy said no, and daddy wasn't home yet to say yes. Not like we do that at our house. They live in this house, 
And I, I am going somewhere with this. And they have the windows that are weird shaped and stuff. And well, they live in a three-story house, apparently. They're rich, I guess. Couldn't afford cookies because they got too big of a house. Here's the teleological. Does that picture make sense? Can you tell what that is? It's not a good picture, but you can tell what it is, right? Um, you can tell it's a, it's a goofy stick man and a smaller stick person and a house I wouldn't want to live in. That one's going to fall apart. I mean, I mean, look at all the leaking that can occur. Anyway, you, but you can tell what it is. There's an order to this. Now, if this happened randomly, it would not look like this. This means someone had to draw this in a way that would make sense. Because if I drew the picture like this, see the pretty house? No, 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 no. I had to put it in a way that you can understand it, which means someone had to do that. Well, when we look at nature, we can see a beautiful organization, a beautiful structure that we can understand. That's why medicine works. We can understand the human body because it's ordered to do so, which means something or someone wants us to understand it, which means that they're trying to tell us something. A painter or a drawer who does right work doesn't just do it for pure entertainment. They're trying to tell you something or evoke something in you. They're trying to get something out of you. They're trying to reveal something. The one who designed the universe or whoever it is wants you to know something. The question is, Who's that thing or person that's trying to reveal itself or himself or herself? Well, we can talk about that. By the way, we know it's God. That's why I like those two arguments. These are fun. But these, I think, are weak because this one, I can imagine all kinds of things that aren't real. And really, do we need a God to have morals? There are plenty of moral atheists out there, they would say. So these, I think, are weak arguments, but I love these. And again, if you want to learn more about them, you can look at the authors that I've mentioned here um, in those. Like I said, it is not up to us to convince anybody. No argument we present will itself convince anyone. It is God who does the convincing. It takes a burden off us and also gives us the comfort in knowing that if God does all the work, when God goes to convince somebody, he's going to make sure that what he wants to have happen will happen. So we can rest in that.